You'd have to be blind as a bat flying backwards in a snowstorm to not see that God is doing something in this church. Amen. Because of that, we all individually have to be careful because we all got flesh. Every one of you got bitterness. Every one of you got wrath. Every one of you have tendencies to vengeance and self-preservation and thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And the Bible teaches these one another principles throughout. Paul mentions one another 25 times. Other places he talks about one toward another, one of another. And see, because we're in one body and members of one another, we all act towards each other in some way. Now you can be toward another in your flesh or in the spirit. Every one of Paul's one another principles are not positive. Some of them are negative. For example, by love, serve one another, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed lest you be consumed. Knowing that God is doing something here, Paul, remember when Paul told the Corinthians to confirm your love to this man, lest Satan get an advantage over us. We have an enemy. We have a foe. As the body of Christ, we are engaged in spiritual conflict with spiritual wickedness in high places and if you ain't careful and you ain't wise, Satan will get an advantage over God's church. And so that's where I'm wanting to go with this is getting into these one another principles. But before you need, before you need to worry about how you're acting towards one another, you first got to learn how to think about yourself. Because the way when people start acting wrong towards each other, it's because they've put themselves on a pedestal. There's pride and other things involved there. When you start grudging and acting out wrath and vengeance and bitterness, it's because you haven't learned how to think about yourself. What is it Paul said over there? He said, receive ye one another as Christ Jesus hath also received us. How did Christ receive you? Then receive one another. Amen? And so I want to start here in Ephesians 2. And kind of lay a foundation of this because this workmanship of God has to do with his salvation. And I want you to notice Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, you see that word for there? Now, let me, let me, let me explain the difference here. Y'all know the difference between good preaching and good doctrine. Hebrews 2.3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's good preaching. It's bad doctrine. That's a great verse to stand on a street corner and say, how are you going to escape if you neglect this great salvation? But the salvation being spoken of in Hebrews is the salvation of Israel at the second coming of Christ. And if they neglect that salvation that's coming, how are they going to escape the wrath that happens before then? So it's good preaching, but it's bad doctrine. For by grace are you saved through faith. That verse will preach on a street corner. Yeah. However, the word for, this verse has been so isolated as a proof text of justification that it's lost its meaning. The word for means that that verse in and of itself was never meant to be an isolated passage used as a proof text for justification. It is in fact, that word for means that this verse is in fact an explanation of a salvation that's already been defined and spoken of within the context. Notice the phrase, for by grace are you saved through faith. Did Paul say that anywhere else? In the context, yes, he did in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. Right there, look at it. Look at what you have here. God's mercy, great love, and grace. His mercy and great love provided a salvation for you by grace. Why is God rich in mercy? Let's look at it there. For his what? Do you know what produces? It was his great love that was the fountain of all the riches of mercy. When you find unmerciful people, love, listen man, saying I love you is cheap. Love, love is a choice that comes out of your heart. It's not a feeling or an emotion. Well, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. That don't even mean anything. A lot of people's confusing love with selfish 
lust of how somebody makes you feel, therefore you respond positive to it. Well, I like the way you make me feel, therefore I, I'm going to be positive toward you because I love you. That's not love. Love is a choice that begins in the heart of the one who loves. And because God had a great love for us, he was rich in mercy toward us. When you find somebody that loves, they are rich in mercy, compassion, pity. Amen? And because of this mercy and great love, even, now watch this, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. You ever love something dead? This rich mercy and great love of God toward us was even when we were dead in sins. And because of that, God by grace saved you. Now notice the salvation in the context. There's nothing in the passage about forgiveness or justification. The salvation Paul is talking of in the context of Ephesians is quickening you from being dead in sin. Because when you were dead in sin, what were you? You had a spirit that works in the children of disobedience and you were by nature a child of wrath. This salvation here has nothing to do with you just being forgiven of your sins. It has to do with God actually saving you by taking a, what somebody that's dead in sin and actually quickening them with Christ. That's the salvation of the context. And notice the salvation is but God, you see that, but God? It means that this is in contrast to what he said in verses 1 through 3. So we got to go back because this salvation is in contrast to what he had just said in verses 1 through 3. So let's go back and look at them. And you hath he quickened. Now guys, the people, people's like this right here. They say, well the word quicken means to make alive. Then why doesn't it say that? Does the Bible say live and life and you did he, you hath he made alive? You know a guy, a guy in a hospital bed on life support is alive, but he ain't quickened. Do you know, you know when we talk about quicksand, you know what quicksand means? It means it, it moves. It's functional. When Paul uses the word quick and remember when he wrote in Romans 8 and says, he says, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead. But then he said, if the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Meaning it'll give life and functionality and movement to a dead body. When Paul says, you hath he quickened who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. God took one who was dead in sin and not just justified him, not just forgave him sins, but quickened him. Now I want you to notice what this being dead in sins deals with. Because what's Paul contrasting? He's contrasting God quickening you when you were dead in sin and when you were dead in sin, where in time past you what? Walked. Look down here, among whom also we all had our what? So being dead in sin was connected to a walk and a conversation. So wouldn't being quickened change that walk and that conversation? So Paul's not just saying, hey, God saved you so that you, know, you can remain dead in trespasses and sins and continue to walk according to the course of this world. Right? When we were dead in sin, we had no choice. Look at this. Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now what? We're going to talk about God's workmanship. The spirit that now worketh in who? As a Christian, if you refuse the renewing of your mind, it's because you love that spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You are in love with the devil. The reason people will watch, binge watch Netflix and not read a Bible is because they're in love with the prince of the power of the air. Amen. 
Among whom, who? These children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That conversation made us the children of wrath. Living our conversation in this world in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling everything that our flesh desired and our mind desired. Just getting up, thinking the only meaning to life was fulfilling what, I, what my flesh wanted and what my mind wanted. God looked upon that and said, child of wrath. And so when we talk about this salvation, guys, it's much more than this bunch of figments of our imagination, these positional truths. God didn't justify me, forgive me, and then leave me dead. He didn't want me walking according to this course anymore. He didn't want my conversation in these things. So when Paul comes back here to Ephesians 2, 4 and says, but God... When you, when you had this spirit that works in the children of disobedience and you were by nature of child of wrath, God who is rich in mercy and for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. The salvation being spoken of here is one of, a, of giving life to what is dead. So that the one who hath been given life might live under the one who gave that life. Amen. 